I have excruciating pain every day. It just affects your whole body. I have muscle pain, I have seizures. Chronic illnesses, difficult to diagnose, that shatter lives. Arthritis-like symptoms. A bit like having the flu for a week only, you have it 24-7 and for years on end. These people believe they're sick with chronic Lyme disease, an illness from ticks they're told doesn't exist in Australia. So I have Lyme disease, people will say, well, that doesn't even exist here, so you just must be making it up. It's a controversial mystery that science has so far been unable to resolve. I do not think we have any proof that Lyme disease exists in Australia. I think there's something else. Have we underestimated the threat from ticks and could they pose a greater risk to public health than we thought? With so many unique animals in Australia, it's not surprising that they're matched with an extraordinary array of native ticks. These ticks don't occur anywhere else in the world, so that's what makes them so special. There you go. Oh, you're fine. Stretch out for us, that's it. Stretch on out. You're all hoping she's going to poop all over me. <laughs> Most native mammals, like this echidna, have their own kind of tick. Each species of Aussie tick carries its own bacterial ecosystem, a microbiome. Amazingly, the microbiomes of most Australian ticks have never been studied before. Uh, these ticks uh, that have evolved here by themselves have uh, a microbiome that is somewhat different to microbiomes in ticks in other parts of the world. At least that's what our research has found so far. That's important because it's inside ticks that the microbes responsible for disease and chronic illness are believed to live. It will take new science on a national scale to hunt for the one or many pathogens that ticks may carry. Well, hey, I think I've got one. It's an adult female. Wildlife may be adapted to tick microbes, but it can be a different story when people are bitten. I think it's perfectly plausible that uh, ticks in Australia can transmit uh, infections uh, that we don't know about yet, uh, and that could cause illness in people. Professor Peter Irwin's lab may be small, but the discoveries here have huge potential to transform our knowledge about the impacts of ticks on public health. Ticks carry the greatest diversity of disease-causing microbes of any arthropods that suck blood. And in this lab at Murdoch University in Perth, they're at the forefront of revealing the full range of bacteria in Australian ticks. We have around 65 species of native ticks in Australia. Around four or five of those bite humans. Uh, that would be in the eastern states, Ixodes holocyclus, the paralysis tick, most commonly. And in Western Australia, it would be the kangaroo tick, Amblyomma trigutatum. And my research is focused on characterising the bacterial communities which occur naturally inside those ticks. For bacteria to have any chance of being transmitted by a tick bite, they need to be at the pointy end. So this is the internal morphology of a tick that has been sectioned in half, essentially. Along the length of its body? Along the length of its body. So if you're looking for pathogenic bacteria in a tick, where do you start? First of all, in the salivary glands, they're quite extensive in the tick. The second area you'd expect to find them is down in the midgut, which is at the back end of the tick. It covers almost all of this area, actually. Right. So really, the majority of the animal is a gut? It's a gut with salivary glands, yeah. <laughs> and legs. Yep. And a piercing instrument. In their tick archive here, I've got more than 20,000 samples of ticks collected from people, domestic animals, and wildlife from all over Australia. This monster, for example, comes from a koala. We identify the tick to a species level under a stereo microscope. And then we extract the DNA from that tick. Uh, so that involves crushing the tick in liquid nitrogen, pulverizing it into a powder, 
and then extracting the DNA from that powder. Using advanced genetic sequencing, they can identify all the bacteria at once from traces of their DNA. We're able to amplify uh, one piece of DNA from many bacterial species and get millions of sequences back. So it really allows us to, instead of looking at one bacteria, to look at the whole diversity in one analysis. Powerful computers crunch the data and colour code the bacterial DNA. Each line is an individual tick and its bacterial microbiome. And so we can see that we've got quite a high diversity. This is just for two species of tick, but you've got sure. upwards of 65 species yeah, of ticks absolutely. in Australia. There's a number of bacteria that can be found in Each this. with their own microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. Bacterial microbiome is actually unique for each tick species. With so many different bacteria in each tick, they've had to develop a new innovation how to see beyond the more common species that mask previously unseen ones. The technique also allows you to amplify very, very small amounts of DNA of these organisms, and uh, that's not been possible previously. We're taking the approach of, let's have a look at all the bacteria that are out there associated with ticks, and of those bacteria, we, we find which of them are likely to cause disease. So how much bigger are they when they're engorged than when they're unengorged? Bacteria are not the only thing inside ticks. Viruses could also make people sick. I normally see a tick as a long string of A, T, C's and G's on the computer screen. Viruses in ticks are even more of a mystery than bacteria. For the first time in Australia, Professor Eddie Holmes is looking for virus genes in samples from ticks and their human hosts. We will then extract all the nucleic acid, that's all the RNA and all the DNA from those, and then we sequence all of that using what's called shotgun sequencing. So we blast it little pieces, then we glue it all together. We remove what's the tick and what's the human, because that's the host, and what's left is microbe. Okay, so that could be bacteria, it could be protozoa, it could be viruses. So then we, then we basically run sets of computational analyses to see what in there is novel, what's new, what haven't we seen before. And hopefully we'll find that the, the human cases have similar sorts of microbes that are also found in the ticks. And that gives the first kind of real signature that we may have transmission of a novel pathogen in these people that's causing a disease. Mapping the microbiomes of Australian ticks is the first step to reveal the cause of mysterious diseases in people and how to treat them. Overseas, the organisms inside ticks are much better known. From these nightly ashes That's where songwriter Seren Spain collided with a tick-borne disease. And I know that you're only biding your time now just to be somebody, somebody, somehow well, I don't Last year, she was travelling through Europe and went camping in an English national park. We're frolicking about and I got bitten by a tick. Didn't find it until I got back to where I was staying um, and had a, had a shower and had a look in the mirror and found it. And I'd been staying in Germany before that and my German friends were very paranoid about ticks, so I had been, you know, I was lucky enough to be aware of the risks. And the risks are high. The ticks that carry Lyme disease from animals to humans are endemic to North America, Europe and Asia. Lyme disease is caused by infection from a group of bacterial species broadly referred to as Borrelia burgdorferi. Their corkscrew-shaped bacteria, also known as spirochetes, able to burrow deep into tissues. The first stage of a Borrelia infection can look like this. In 50% of cases, patients will get a bullseye rash, and it can be on their body where the tick's bitten them. But that's only 50%. Now, in a Lyme country, like in Europe or America, that is diagnostic. And uh, that's enough to say you've got Lyme disease. How if it's real, and how if it's real. Seren didn't get the telltale rash, but she started feeling very ill a month or so after the tick bite. One week I had a flu and then I thought I was better and then the next week I had, you know, strange swollen glands and then I was feeling really tired and sleeping strangely and week to week it would kind of, it was just really bizarre. Um, 
all kinds of symptoms. She returned to Australia and told her doctor she suspected Lyme disease. So if a patient came back from overseas and said, I have been bitten by a tick, I think I've got Lyme disease, like Saren did, her GP did the tests and then referred her to me. Dr Andrew Fuller says while Lyme is a rare disease in Australia, all the patients he's treated got it overseas. If you treat people early, they're cured easily with doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for four weeks. It's, a, it, it's very easy to cure Lyme disease early. You think that I'm flying too close to the sun, so high. Saren was lucky. The antibiotics worked and she's now fully recovered. She says it's important for GPs to be Lyme aware. The day I, I'd go to the doctor was the day I was feeling good enough to go to the doctor. So me saying, oh, I felt like death the other day, um, you know, they'd look at me and go, nah, you don't have a fever, you seem fine. But really, um, it can, it gets debilitating and over time, um, it can get to the point where people are diagnosed with chronic fatigue or MS and I think it's easy to be overlooked. Dr Bernie Hudson runs a lab in Sydney that tests for Lyme and other tick-borne diseases, although that's a small part of their work. What we do know from overseas is if you've got Lyme disease and you're treated early, most people get better. The biggest problem usually is people that uh, there's a long delay in the diagnosis. Here's the conundrum. There's no evidence that the tick vectors or the bacteria that cause Lyme occur naturally in Australia. But people still present with Lyme-like illnesses, even if they haven't been overseas. If this condition is here and people are denied treatment, then you'll have a group of people say, uh, you know, who've been unwell for years that will say, well, if I'd have been treated back then when I had first two weeks of doxycycline, I would have been fine. If they looked after every single one of us in this room or our family members, then clearly most of us would not be sitting at this table and would be out. The problem is that symptoms of Lyme disease can look like other conditions. EM rash and Bell's palsy. Mm -hmm. I had both. Um, I still had this pussy sore on my arm. My adrenals would crash, my nervous system would crash. Been admitted to hospital more than 300 times. You get a tick bite and we get sick, we can't connect the dots because the official message is that it's not here. So the people at this support group in Perth suffer a range of long-term chronic illnesses they call Lyme-like disease. I spoke to the doctor and he said, no, you don't have that. There's no way you have that. We don't have that in Australia. Even though I kept repeating, I was bitten by a tick in Vietnam. It's destroying my feet, my knees. It's already destroyed the joints of my hands. I've needed to go to hospital so many times and I haven't because they just don't know what to do and they can't help me. And often I leave worse than when I went in. Not everyone can trace their chronic illnesses back to a tick bite. I didn't see a tick, but I did get a bullseye rash. I don't remember a tick bite. Um, I didn't have any rash. To be sure, I've got no recollection of a tick bite. In WA, former emergency nurse Kylie Fielden remembers the tick well and thought nothing of it at the time. Little did I know that the, the tick bite that I got that day would change my life. What followed were years of unexplained illnesses, inconclusive tests, misdiagnoses, and medication for rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue. I couldn't get over the fact that everyone was saying, just wait and see, because an emergency, if you wait and see, people die. I couldn't go to work, couldn't get up and cook and clean for myself. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck and reversed over several times. I had pain everywhere in places that I didn't even know that you could get pain. Um, the fatigue was so um, debilitating. Eventually I got to see this doctor. He took my history and did a physical exam and he said, I am willing to bet that you have Lyme's disease. Several thousand dollars worth of blood tests in Germany later, her results came back positive to antibodies for Borrelia, as well as other bacteria such as Yersinia 
and chlamydia. She traces her diagnosis of chronic Lyme back to that one tick bite. It was such a relief for somebody to tell me what I had. And, you know, reading the acute symptoms of Lyme's disease was exactly what I had. I had the flu-like symptoms, I had the fever, I had the, the, the achy joints. Um, and if I had been treated then, um, I wouldn't be where I am today. <coughs> this is where the controversy comes in. Even in the US, where Lyme disease is endemic, medical authorities say chronic Lyme doesn't exist because it's not caused by an ongoing infection and therefore shouldn't be treated with antibiotics. In the US, Dr Eva Sapi's research is part academic pursuit and part personal passion. She's mostly recovered from a bout of Lyme disease she contracted around 10 years ago. From day one, when nobody could tell me what's wrong with me, I started to research it and read all day. Since I couldn't go anywhere, I was so sick. Ava applies her skills in genetics and molecular biology to try and explain why chronic Lyme persists. She found that like other bacteria, the free-living Borrelia bacteria can also form defensive colonies called biofilms. Biofilms are created by bacteria that coordinate to build a fortress and protect themselves from threats. And that's a tantalising discovery for Borrelia. Because if it's a real biofilm, it means they can be extremely resistant to antibiotics, which is known for other bacteria. This may explain why antibiotics aren't always effective. A recent Dutch clinical trial shows that patients with chronic symptoms from a past episode of Lyme disease aren't helped by long courses of antibiotics. Years after her tick bite, Kylie still takes a mountain of medications. I've had to um, have a lot of changes to the antibiotics that I'm on. I'm also on quite a few things now for my liver to help boost its function and keep it healthy while I'm um, taking all these antibiotics. What actually causes the chronic symptoms, however, remains a mystery. Do they have other things that the Lyme disease has triggered uh, or is it something completely different? And, and that's hard to answer without good diagnostic tests. So in other words, after you've diagnosed someone with Lyme disease, how do you know whether the organism's gone away and disappeared from their body? We don't. How, is there a test for activity of Lyme disease? There isn't. Is there a test that gets better when you've been effectively treated and becomes abnormal again when you get sick again. There isn't a test like that. It's an issue not just for Lyme, but for other infections transmitted by ticks in Australia, like scrub typhus or spotted fever. Here in the urban bushland around Sydney, it's quite likely you'll pick up a tick. And if you did get injected with microbes from a tick bite, and you got sick, then diagnosing your disease can be a challenge. There are basically three ways to diagnose a tick-borne disease. The gold standard is to take a biopsy and grow the microbes in a lab, matching what's in the tick to what's in people. The next best way is to use a DNA test, but that's not as good as finding the organisms themselves. A few labs in Australia do it, like Stephen Graves' lab at the Barwon University Hospital in Geelong. Ironically, the least direct way to diagnose tick diseases like Lyme is the one that's relied on the most, blood tests or serology. And it's a really not a good way to make a diagnosis because instead of looking at the microbe, you're looking at the response of the microbe in the patient. So the patient is infected by the microbe and their immune system produces antibodies which are in their blood. And so we take some of their blood and look for those antibodies in the patient's serum. And so it's a back doorway of making the diagnosis. It's like Robinson Crusoe. He saw the footprint in the sand and he didn't see Man Friday, he saw the footprint in the sand. So that's equivalent to serology. A big challenge in using blood tests for Lyme disease is that there are no antibodies in the early stages of the illness. And if the patient is treated with antibiotics, there may never be antibodies. 
Well, this is what's called a Western blot serological test. Um, and this particular variant is looking for the immunoglobulin G class, which is the main antibody produced by patients who are infected with Borrelia. So this serological test, this blood test, is like a litmus paper for certain antibodies. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. And this top line here is the positive control. You can see all of the components of the bacterium have antibodies produced against them. So this is definitely a patient with Lyme disease. And then the next line down is the negative one. Notice how there are no bands there. So this patient here has been had Lyme disease, this patient here has not. And all these other patients are the ones that we're testing in the diagnostic laboratory to answer the referring doctor's query, does my patient have Lyme disease or don't they? Dr Stephen Graves here phoning you about your patient John Brown. And how many bands does your strip have to score in order to get a positive diagnosis? That's a very contentious question. So it's a full hand for positive Lyme disease. So I'm fairly confident this patient has got Lyme disease because it varies from place to place and from laboratory to laboratory. There are different tests for European and US strains of Borrelia. To be positive, Germany requires two out of 10 bands. The rest of Europe requires three. And the US requires five out of 10. But in Australia, without a Lyme Borrelia, we've got nothing to compare it to. So it's got to be the right bands at the right intensity, the right number, then it's a positive. And that's why sometimes people get confused. They think that it's positive because there are some bands, but in fact, it's not sufficient. In my first consultation with him, he suggested a Lyme's disease test. People with Lyme-like symptoms who get a negative serological result in Australia often go to the expense of getting another test done overseas that comes back positive. How is the test overseas validated? So if it's for a Lyme disease or a Lyme-like illness acquired in Australia, there is no organism, so how can you validate the test that's done overseas? Blood results were uh, sent away to Germany. I had tests done in Australia as well as Germany. That's not an easy task either, trying to actually find somebody who will listen to you and then organise testing. It's not, not an easy task. If we find pathogens in ticks and we're able to show that people are getting infected with them, then we may be able to say, well, OK, it might not all be Borrelia burgdorferi. It may be that when you get a tick bite, you get a whole range of different bugs that are introduced. And some of these are more likely to be associated with people remaining unwell. Can you get false positives by getting cross-reactions with other bacteria in your blood? Indeed you can. In fact, these, these bands here that you can see are almost certainly false positives. These are all what we call cross-reacting antibodies that have been produced by the patient's immune system in response to probably some other type of infection, another virus, another bacterium, maybe even another Borrelia, but not the Borrelia that's causing Lyme disease. In fact, false positives could be caused by other spirochete bacteria, including harmless species of Borrelia that live naturally in our mouths and guts. If Lyme Borrelia did exist in Australia, veterinary disease experts like Professor Peter Irwin would expect to find it in animals that are often exposed to ticks and their infections, like dogs. We've been doing that research for a few years. We've tested quite a few hundred dogs now. We used very specific uh, tests for Lyme Borreliosis uh, that's used in America or, or Europe and we used uh, Western blots and uh, more generalised serology. And it's really interesting, the dogs didn't show any positives for Lyme Borrelia. The very specific tests were all negative. So where does all this leave people who are sick and wanting answers? Well, it doesn't help that the controversy about Lyme disease in Australia is so intensely polarised. No doubt this story will cop flack from those who say you shouldn't touch it and from those who say you haven't gone far enough. But as science catches up with the public debate, there's new hope that the mysteries can be solved. For the first time in the world, Australia's National Serology Reference Lab is checking the reliability of blood tests for Lyme disease to sort out why different labs produce different results, both here and overseas. You know, it could be embarrassing, even for us, for example, but the fact is, is that the way you determine whether the tests 
uh, good enough to be able to recommend to people as a way of confirming the, or excluding the diagnosis. After years of work, Eva Suppy's research has confirmed that Lyme Borrelia can form biofilms deep in the heart, brain and kidneys. What we see so far that Borrelia biofilm do exist in the human body and in infected mouse tissues and we do believe that is one of the reasons that, that uh, chronic Lyme disease exists. It means the patient might not never recover if we don't address the biofilm presence. If we know where is the biofilm, what kind of chemical structure it has, now we can go and hopefully we can have a treatment for it. Now that's a bit of a game changer because it, it could explain why antibiotics sometimes don't work and it could explain in particular why antibiotics later in the illness don't, don't work. The search continues for a home-grown native pathogen causing Lyme-like illness in Australia. Peter Irwin's lab hasn't found it yet, but they have found a new type of bacterium in 40% of ticks taken from echidnas in the eastern states. Australia has its own Borrelia. At the moment, we don't know whether it can cause disease. We only know that it's found in echidna ticks. Peter warns against jumping to conclusions. As soon as it was found out that we'd found a Borrelia, everyone assumed, I think, that it was a Lyme, Lyme disease causing Borrelia. But it's really important to point out that this is a different type of Borrelia. It's genetically related to Lyme Borrelia, but it is very clearly different. No one has sequenced every bacteria in, in the world, and so there's always going to be unknown things that we come up with. As for new viruses, the search has just begun. In ticks from the northern suburbs of Sydney, Eddie Holmes has already found the genes of a virus never seen before. Its closest relative appears to be viruses that they've just found in North America that cause human disease, a thing called Bourbon virus. Now, we can't prove it causes disease in Australia, but it's a very strong indication that, that these ticks carry things that are novel and potentially may cause disease. And obviously that's something to follow in great detail now. No one wants chronic Lyme to exist, especially our sufferers. It is truly a horror story of epic proportions. While a Senate inquiry investigates if Lyme-like illness is an emerging tick-borne disease in Australia, some things are already clear. I really don't care what it's called. Um, you can call it whatever you want. We just want treatment. That's all we're after. People's lives are changed forever. I have had to let my nursing registration go. That life for me doesn't exist anymore. But I have moved on and I um, am excited to see where life takes me now. Early diagnosis and treatment is vital. You might have an illness that's a little bit different. Be aware that, yeah, that you might need to go about things in a different way and be more forthright. With Aussie ticks yet to reveal all their secrets, the quest continues.